it's Ming Canada here. You are listening to the Trips and Global on Wheels Podcast Hour, the place to be to learn about the latest and greatest life stories from people who are doing incredible disability advocacy work. Dr. Dinesh Palapama, welcome to the Trips and Global on Wheels Podcast Hour. Hey, thanks for having me, Ming. Of course. So I'm going to read your bio for people who are not familiar with you. Dinesh Palapana was the first quadriplegic medical intern in Queensland and the second person to graduate medical school with quadriplegia in Australia. Dinesh earned a Bachelor of, of Laws prior to completing his Doctor of Medicine at the Griffith University. He has completed an advanced clerkship in radiology at the Harvard University. Halfway through medical school, Dinesh was involved in a catastrophic motor vehicle accident that caused a cervical spinal cord injury. As a result of his injury and experiences, Dinesh has been an advocate for inclusivity in medicine and the workplace generally. He is a founding member of Doctors with Disabilities in Australia. Dinesh was the Gold Coast Hospital and Health Services Junior Doctor of the Year in 2018. He was also awarded the Medal of the Order of uh, Australia in 2019. Congrats on all of your accomplishments, Dr. Dinesh Palapana. Thank you, it's been an amazing journey. So the first question, I have for you is you are an emergency department doctor. What advice do you have for people with disabilities in general during this pandemic? What do people with disabilities need to be especially careful about during this, you know, COVID-19 pandemic era? And what should they take into consideration? This situation that the world has found itself in has created some very uh, important critical conversations about healthcare for people with disability. We know that there's been a healthcare gap and disparity for people with disability and those without for a long time. There's also been um, in disaster and emergency situations, people with disabilities are much more worsely affected than those without. Two examples are uh, when the tsunami and earthquake happened in Japan. People with disabilities were twice as more likely to die than people without. It was the same when Hurricane Katrina occurred. Um, People with disabilities had more trouble being evacuated from the disaster zone and getting the system that they need. So these situations create some very difficult challenges for people with disabilities. From a social perspective, I think it's really important to have the support networks that you need in place, um, the logistics that you need in place, even things like gleaning groceries and medical supplies in place, and to isolate yourself early on so you don't run a risk of being infected. And it's the same for your caregivers. So if you have caregivers coming in on a day-to-day basis, it's important to make sure that you have the right steps in place to keep them safe and keep them from getting infected because if your caregivers get infected then your entire support structure falls apart and then you can potentially end up in a hospital or somewhere where you're at more risk of complications so that's one side of it the second thing is when you actually turn up into a hospital you know that that's always a difficult thing for people that have chronic medical conditions or disabilities I was at a symposium a little while ago at Stanford Medicine X, where we had patients and doctors talk about their experiences. And some of the patients say that they got got PTSD almost from their hospital presentations previously, and they try to avoid going to a hospital at all costs. Ironically, me being a doctor, I'm the same. I don't want to go to hospital uh, unless I'm dying. But if you do end up at hospital, The worst case scenario that you need to think about is in healthcare rationing. So we've seen some really extreme circumstances in places like Italy and in the United States where there's been a fear or at least concern of running out of ventilators, which which is the most extreme example that you're going to get to in these situations. 
So if there's a situation, for example, where me, a 35-year-old with a spinal cord injury, and then another 35-year-old without a spinal cord injury need access to one ventilator that's left, Medically, the likelihood is that the other guy is going to survive. He's got a higher probability of surviving than me because his lungs are working normally. Um, he's otherwise healthy. So people with disability often have an underlying medical comorbidity or condition that makes them more susceptible to a worse outcome. So the conversation that we're having in society is how do we allocate these resources? And I think um, that's why it's really important to prevent yourself from getting infected in the first place so we don't have to make these decisions. It's also important for us as a community of people with disabilities to tell the broader community that by preventing these outbreaks and preventing these pandemics and preventing spread, you're protecting the most vulnerable people in society. And I think that's important. The other steps that you can take, I suppose, are um, having some advanced care planning steps in place to say what you want and don't want in healthcare. And I think having those decisions um, ready and set in case you become incapacitated cognitively or consciously um, will help medical professions make decisions. But it's a really complex thing and it's a really complex situation, but I think we need to start planning and having some conversations about how to address it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's very insightful. Since your recovery, how has your views towards um, human nature changed? Oh my God, it's changed so much. Um, I was 25 when I had the accident and sadly for a lot of people that's around the age group, you know, it's, it's generally it tends to be males in their twenties that have the, accident. I think when you're in your early 20s, you, you're kind of just plodding along with life, feeling invincible and sometimes not really having a huge amount of insight into humanity and what goes on. But you know, as soon as this accident happened, I was plunged into sharing um, a hospital room with three other people from all different walks of life. And um, spinal cord injury doesn't really discriminate in that way. So I went through this journey with so many people and I also spent a little bit of time in Sri Lanka after the accident where I was born. So I got to see such a broad spectrum of um, what happens to people. I mean, in, in Sri Lanka compared to Australia, a lot of people have a terrible life expectancy and a terrible quality of life after an injury like this. So I got to see the broad nature of that, but I also got to see the worst of humanity in the way that some people interacted with me and have injuries but I also got to deal with the best of humanity and see it so people coming together and my friends staying so close to me and supporting me through this whole time my mum who's an amazing woman who stuck with me every single day since this accident and you know people coming together and supporting each other through this society coming together to do the right thing and creating change to make the world more accessible for people you know you, you, you get thrown into challenging things at different points in your life but we all have that capacity to get through it even though it seems so dark but it's definitely changed the way i see humanity and human nature a lot yeah that's great the next question is what is your top advice yeah. advice for how able-bodied people could better interact with people with disabilities what are some hiccups that you've seen that you think mm, that could be smoother don't have any preconceptions about what, what this means. Don't have any um, preconceived notions about, oh, you know, this person's using a wheelchair. I feel like a normal guy. And I think for me, anyway, I just like to be treated as a normal person. And um, everyone's different, you know, whether you have a disability or not, there are certain things that people like. There are certain ways that people like to be treated. So listen to that treat everyone as an individual and as a human being. Yeah, no, that's so right. I think a lot of times we do get distracted by what we see on the outside, even though those could be defining features, but a lot of who we are, you can't see. You really have to get to know the person. And so speaking of fiance and relationships, what advice do you have for people with 
you know, spinal cord injuries like yourself who are looking to get into a relationship, the dating scene, finding their Mr. or Mrs. And um, I know that you've personally encountered some challenges and overcome them. So any advice yeah. you have? Look, it's, um, it's not an easy thing. I, I, I was single for about 10 years after the accident. And I, I just, you know, I, I didn't really have an interest in dating. I was going, I was back in med school. I was focusing on all that. And I didn't really have any interest in engaging in that part of my life just let let things take its natural course i think when you try to go look for someone or when you try to force it whether you're disabled or not it just adds that extra pressure and you might end up in a relationship that you don't want to be but just let it come naturally and when you come across the right person you'll know which is what happened to me you know i i met my fiance she's a nurse in the emergency department so i met her while working and i just knew that she was the right girl and everything else just falls into place. I don't think she really, she just sees me as a normal guy and um, we just have a normal life together. And you work it out. And really the injury doesn't play a part in it. We just have the normal stuff that anyone else does. And it's scary. It's, it is scary. And, but I, f I think a lot of the challenges that you have are in your own head, which certainly was the case for me. So just put it aside and try and just have a go at it and be take it as a normal person because that's what you are and that's what we are mm -hmm. yeah so what aspects about being in a relationship with someone a romantic relationship scared you the most when you were you know ready to find a partner i understand you just said you're mm -hmm. engaged now so prior to yeah. were you ready to look or did she just come out of nowhere yeah, I never really looked. I mean, I've, I've um, hung out with some amazing girls over the last few years that I've met and that I've interacted with. But it, it was scary from a lot of perspectives. I think um, you have a lot of fears in your head, not, not particularly just one thing, but a whole heap of things, you know, uh, whether it be share, sharing things physically or whether it be emotionally or how you're perceived or whatever else. It's just about being being open and you just, you kind of have to be vulnerable and you have to give it a shot. You have to have the courage to do that with the right person because you, you don't know. It might be the best thing that you've ever done and it might, um, you might have the love of your life. You don't know. Yeah, but it, it takes it takes a fair bit of courage and it's scary. Mm, yeah thank you so much for sharing i know that can be hard for anybody yeah thank you so you were born in sri lanka and you moved to australia yeah. when you were 10 in sydney right yeah. sydney was your first location so what is the difference i'm curious between sri lankan's attitude towards people with disabilities and australians attitude towards people with disabilities ah uh, yeah it's it's um one of the one of the most uh, stark things that I actually realized is when I went back to Sri Lanka, they used the word differently abled a lot. Whereas in Australia it's just it's disability. And I know words have a lot of different meaning to different people and they can be politically loaded, but that, that was one of the most stark things that I noted. Differently abled in Sri Lanka and disabled in Australia. So I guess at some point in time someone in society must have taken a stance and said, this is the wording that we're going to use. And I know in Australia at the moment, there's a movement in some pockets to, to actually change the meaning of the word disability itself so that it's not stigmatized or whatever else. In Sri Lanka, I think I was lucky enough to be a part of the metropolitan society. So the, I guess it's not so much the disadvantaged group of people that I interacted with and by and large I felt fairly normal but education is still a challenge for them and for rural Sri Lankans living with a disability it's a pretty pretty dire situation there's no medical support or there's little medical support there's certainly little social support and society can sort of stigmatize them a little bit as well and i know the life expectancy in them was a lot less than for someone without a disability in australia i think we've been very lucky there's the 
national disability insurance scheme that ensures that Australians with disabilities have the necessary support to live a meaningful and productive life. There's still a rural and metropolitan disparity where rural Australians with a disability have a little bit of a tougher time. But I think certainly the social structures are a lot better and the government structures are a lot better in Australia to make it a lot easier to live. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's very insightful and uh, with that cross-cultural comparison. So that was the, actually the last question. Thank you so much, Danish, for being so open and being vulnerable. And I know that some of the topics are uncomfortable as it is. I'm, I'm so happy that you are so open. I saw that even this month, you were on several podcasts and several different platforms, sharing and talking to people. And I think that's wonderful because people with disabilities are not in the media enough, you know, expressing, talking about their lives, talking about the challenges, talking about their victories, talking about the things that make them happy. And um, all of these things were, like you said earlier, were people too, who like ordinary, normal things. And if people with disabilities like us shy away from the more uncomfortable, tricky topics, then that embarrassment, I think, that feeling of embarrassment, shame, will just linger longer rather than moving on like, oh, Dinesh faces that same kind of challenge. Me too. This is how he handled it. So thank you so much for sharing your story, giving your advice, and uh, I'm sure our listeners will learn a lot from you. Uh, Thank you so much. uh... Did you like this video? If so, share with your friends and be sure to follow us on social media. And if you want even more resources, be sure to sign up for our email updates on our website, traipsingglobal.com. Keep learning new perspectives. Keep being inclusive because it will make the world a better place for you and for everyone else. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you on another episode of the Traipsing Global on Wheels podcast hour.